what I want to do is really go into kind of thinking about entrepreneurship, innovation, and how these different gentlemen started their businesses, not pitching what they're doing, but being a grubby little startup, how do you do it? How do you think about your business model? How do you think about sales cycle? And, and build a company in the healthcare IT space. And I'm a venture capitalist that has done a lot of startups in early stage companies. And what I find is that, uh, you know, it takes a special individual to really create a company in healthcare IT. And so that's what we're going to really cover. And then uh, my goal is to have 30 minutes of questions. If everybody wants to go drink, well, I'll go drink. So, uh, but we'll start. So, I guess I'm going to start with uh, my, my first question. And, and I think uh, a lot of people like to know how you thought about starting your company. Why did you do that? So, Chinny, I look at your background, which is an insert. You shouldn't be here. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> healthcare, kind of, you know, what did you know? And kind of what led you to think about this and start your business? So, um, hi, good evening. My name is Chinny. I run a company called Get Insured, which is, um, you know, the simplest way to explain it is that it's Travelocity for health insurance. And um, if you're at your website or iPad, you can go in and sort of put your zip and tell us your age and we'll tell you what plans, uh, you know, you can buy and you can compare and shop and choose. Um, you know, before this, I was a entrepreneur who built a company in the security software space where you know, our customers were sort of banks and the defense department and so on and so forth. So healthcare is very new and very different. And admittedly, I'm not a doctor by training either. Uh, I'm a you know, computer scientist. And, uh, so um, for us, it was a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, you know, healthcare was and now remains the single largest sector in the economy. Um, it's pretty screwed up. Um, it lags the adoption of modern information technology, you know, relative to other financial services that I'm familiar with, easily by 10 years, if not more. Um, and then there is sort of the why now question, which is, um, you know, there are numerous attempts at sort of modernizing and taking various attempts at sort of modernizing healthcare IT, the consumption of healthcare, how you know, health payments is distributed. Um, but we felt at the time, and we still feel now, that you know, the advance and application, there are interesting and um, you know, high reward, low risk ways to apply you know, computer and internet technology to point problems in the healthcare ecosystem where you, know, you can um, you know, really create, create great businesses. And as you know, Tom, from our experience. So I guess I'm just going to give you five minutes. Somebody here, kind of, how'd you focus on this? I mean, you could have been at Stanford Hospital selling Epic, you know. I mean, so what, what was kind of the key driver as you were kind of thinking about where you're going to focus and how you were going to build your business? So for us, it, for me personally, it was a couple of things. So first of all, I don't know anything about providers or selling to hospitals. So I wasn't about to, you know, go build a business. Uh, you know, that fundamentally required, you know, knowledge and skill and ability in an area where I had no experience base. And what I know most about is, you know, uh, e-commerce, the computer, the internet, how to, you know, bring and lever, you know, computers and internet to, you know, make systems and processes more efficient. Um, and as you know, Tom, you know, we try, we looked at, you know, numerous verticals around you know, drugs and doctors and providers, and there's other businesses that have succeeded, but we found that the place where consumers made the most proactive decision around the purchase of healthcare was when they were buying their health insurance plan. And so that was a place where we could intervene and, you know, we had a measure of success. So, you know, like any good investor, you sort of, you know, you put your, 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 your energy and your efforts behind the things that work, and that's how we are where we are. And as you built your team, you took two or three people you knew in the past and brought them in, or did you hire domain experts? So we did two things. We, um, in, in a healthcare IT, we, I think it's, uh, you know, building good healthcare IT firms um, requires that building the right culture where you bring sort of the IT side of the house and the healthcare side of the house together. So I think, you know, we have... We were fortunate in being able to hire, 
Um, you know, people who, that came out of Healthion, WebMD, you know, great companies that have been in that intersection before. And to this day, I would say that when we, you know, look for people who are generalists, we're certainly looking for passion uh, with respect to healthcare, because, you know, healthcare is its own beast, and, um, you know, if what's important to you in life is to make money, there's easier ways to make money. So, so David, I look at your background, you're in Arizona, you know, thinking about air pollution or something, you go to the White House, and now you're running a company. What, <laughs> what, what, what went wrong there? I thought Arizona was a pretty good place, you know? Um, I really, my company is, is entirely rooted in like a story of personal frustration. So uh, I'm an anthropologist, studied asthma my whole career, was embedded essentially in the Department of Peds doing um, asthma related work to put myself through graduate school and then went to the CDC with the idea that, oh, I was going to work in outbreak investigations and, and uh, kind of catch asthma at a weird moment when it's, when it's, um, um, when it's spreading through a population in, in, in ways that revealed something new about it. Um, you know, learned SAS, like parked myself there, and, and essentially realized very quickly that we were looking at data that was two years old and not geographically specific enough to do anything with. Um, kind of got lured away into the academic side and to the School of Medicine in Wisconsin, and, um, and wor began working back on, the, on kind of clinical care and treatment and realized that you know, oh no, like physicians suffer from this same lack of information and patients are often confused and have weird expectations about how well they should be doing. And so looked at those gaps, essentially uh, this like frustrating situation between sort of what we knew about asthma and should be able to accomplish and how far we had actually gotten and just said, you know, no more. Like I have an opportunity to go after this in some fundamental way and, um, and, and sort of give it the Tanya Harding treatment and, um, uh, and I can tell we're getting late in the day, you know. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, and and um, and started it, you know, in kind of my um, really JV lab there on, on campus, and then realized that if I was going to make a dent, it wasn't going to be in through like you know R twenty one and R one grant cycles. It was going to be because I like built a farm and actually invested in you know like big technology and brought in awesome people. And, and uh, you know, and stopped being a hunter-gatherer for funding and, and actually became like an industrial farm and rolled this out and went after a persistent and, you know, frustrating issue, which is chronic respiratory disease and how little we've done to make a dent in that. So That's, that's great. Hamid, I, I see in your background four startups at 20 years. You can't keep a job or, you know, what's, <laughs> you know, so how did, how did you evolve and where you are, you know? Oh, my last company. First of all, thanks for having us here. This, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, my last company was a digital imaging company. Uh, imaging is probably the second most expensive part of uh, healthcare, and it's become more and more advanced to the point that just about every physician relies on it for either diagnosis or treatment planning. Uh, it got to a point that the number of exams, the number of images per exams were too much for radiologists, so it had to go in a digital format, you couldn't hang enough film anymore. So in my last company, uh, we automated that process. We were successful, got installed in 1,000 hospitals, uh, and I left uh, in the middle of the no, I, I wasn't giving you grief <laughs> about your career tenure. But then as you looked at the nucleus and how you kind of looked at partners, and you started kind of at a different approach than these other two gentlemen and how you approached building a business. Maybe you could share that. Sure. Uh, I'm an engineer by education, and I learned a long time, and I've, all I've ever done is healthcare IT for the last 30 years or so. Uh, I learned early on that if you want to build a clinical system, you start it inside the hospital, you sit next to a doctor, and you build it from there as opposed to build it in your labs and then figure it out afterwards. Uh, I partnered with Mass General Hospital where I had started a previous company, and in this case, it was much more convenient to start with the piece of software that they had already developed. It was kind of an unfinished thought. And we licensed that from them, uh, gave them some equity, small percentage of the company, uh, no royalties. That was a hard negotiation with Harvard and the way they run their IP systems. You perhaps know that better than anyone. 
So we pulled the rabbit out of the hat the way we structured that deal, and it uh, gave them a lot of motivation to be very helpful to us. It wasn't something that they were going to sit back. They were very actively uh, helping us build the system. Sounds like kind of in your model, you know, as you look at technology adoption, was it critical to have Mass General or partners as kind of each of you, I'd like to understand kind of how does a customer or consumer, whoever you're selling to, adopt your technology? Because we heard earlier, Dr. Milstein said it's 17 years from best practices to execution. And I've gone through a lot of, I've successfully lost a lot of money waiting for hospitals and customers to buy things. So how, how do you think about that from a standpoint of, of your adoption? And did it help to have partners or did it hurt or... Maybe you could share that. Sure. Uh, I think your mileage varies depending on what product you're coming, uh, bringing up to market. In our case, we were addressing an undefined market. We were talking about taking imaging out of radiologists' hands and putting them in hands of non-radiologists, something that had never been done before. Radiologists have always been known as the gatekeepers of imaging inside healthcare, and they own the images, they own the machinery, they have a great lobby that managed to keep everybody else out of that business and that made billions doing it. So we were the first ones that wanted to disrupt that to a certain degree. And you couldn't do that without proof of, of actual usage. And it just so turned out that the kind of deal we cut with Harvard, as I mentioned, helped us go from effectively idea to product in nine months, our first product. Our first product got installed in January of 2010. Now it's being used by 140 the largest health systems in the country. We exchanged 1.8 million exams, I don't know, 400 million images, and la di da. So it, it helped us tremendously to speed up. Even but, got Stanford. <laughs> so, so David, as you look at your your approach, you're in Wisconsin, kind of. You know, it wasn't like you could find Chinny down the corner here in Los Gatos. How did how did you think about the technology and consumers and bringing that together? Madison is the ethics center of the world. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, we have we've been very fortunate. We've had great people um, help us get started. Like we have a program running with Dignity Health that started early on in our in our life, in our kind of our early adolescence, and it's grown up there. It's been running for a year there now. Um, the California Healthcare Foundation came um, in behind us and helped support and build out an, um, an econometric analysis of that program that's been, that's been very valuable. So it's not been, it's a game, been a game of inches for us. Like, let's get a little bit further down, survive, look around, things have, you know, improved. Um, uh, you know, and get, you have more options, but you do have to survive and make a little bit of progress. And fortunately, um, we've had people from you know all over the country help contribute to that. So, Shani, I remember when you started your company, kind of on the technology, you were lo looking at the people that were watching TV between one and four a.m. or something. You know, I mean, as you started your company and get insured, how did you uh, how did you think about the technology? Because you're very consumer driven and you had to be very cost effective and that $100,000 TV ad that didn't work, how, how did you justify that to your board and think about that? So um, the best way to think about it is uh, it turns out that although consumer marketing can be scary, the, the kinds of bets that we make in uh, things like drug, de drug development are far more scary in, other, in the sense that you know, we're reaching out to the customer. Um, we're always asking the question, you know, is it easier to reach out to that customer when they're searching for health insurance on Google or uh, when they're driving down to work and uh, you reach them on the radio or you reach them in the evening when they're watching TV or, you know, you reach them because uh, they have a particular disease condition and, you know, that's a or are up for some procedure or whatever, and that's a good time to, to talk to them. It turns out that the last is a particularly good time to motivate a consumer to buy health insurance, but also the only time when a health insurer will refuse to sell that person health insurance. So, because um, insurance is a put, you know, insurance has all these moral hazard issues that, uh, you know, the Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, you know, does a lot to harmonize. But, uh, you know, our business, uh, 
you know, up to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, Tom had a lot to do with traditional consumer marketing of consumer financial products and, uh, you know, building an online experience that was complete in every respect. Because what's ultimately hard about our space is um, we represent, you know, 12,000 health insurance plans um, across 61 carriers in all 50 states. And what that means is that we have to integrate with every single one of those carriers and get their plans and get their rates and know what the rates are and when they're updated and when we sell a plan, be able to sort of update it in their back office. And although our website and the website experience is a very simple one, what's behind that in terms of a back office experience, to really integrate and build this um, consumer e-commerce experience off of a health insurance uh, information technology base that can only be kindly described as diverse is, uh, is tremendous. And, and that's really where you know, we built value for you know, the first several years. So, so you mentioned Obamacare. What, what, how did that impact your business? And maybe share kind of what you think is the opportunity. I mean, we see Obamacare is, is really a, a wave of change. You know? And you know, everybody kind of talks about it, but no one knows what's really going to happen in Massachusetts, uh, where Hamid's located, is kind of experienced it, but it's not the full the full uh, extent of that and as we look at that. So how did that affect your business and kind of going forward? So we'll start with what, how we see the Affordable Care Act first. I mean, um, in many ways it is generational in scope. Um, I mean, if you think about how all of us here consume health insurance, most people get it from their employer. Uh, that's about 120 million Americans. Uh, or um, if you're older than 65, you get it from Medicare. And those are the two largest population bases of people that get health insurance in one way, shape, or form. Um, for the first time in January of 2014, you will have roughly 17 million new consumers that will enter the market in one fell swoop over sort of a two to three year period, becoming active consumers and purchases of, of health insurance. And that is, it's huge. There's nothing like that in any consumer market that you know has occurred in sort of you know history that we can all sort of remember. It is it is it's quite gigantic in its scope. And there's a couple of things that change. Um, regulatory change makes the whole process a lot more digital because it now you know the dirty secret of health insurance is that until now you know consume, uh, an insurer in the consumer market could discriminate against you because of your health condition. Because if you had diabetes, you had asthma, you had you know, heart disease, I'm sorry, you were out of luck. We, we weren't gonna insure you. Um, all of that goes away. And, um, you know, there are no pre-existing conditions. So the whole market now can be, is for the first time one where if you have asthma and uh, you live in Palo Alto and you like to go to the Palo Alto Medical Foundation and, you know, your child sees a pediatrician uh, you can optimize for your particular situation and buy the plan that's laser targeted for your needs. This has never occurred in history, uh, you know, certainly in American healthcare. Um, we've all either accepted the plan our employer gave us or Medicare gave us, or you know, you know, the, the business of actively searching for good plans is a fringe market at best, and it's going to uh, affect one in five Americans. For us, it's a huge opportunity, uh, and it's a huge opportunity in two ways because. For the first time, um, you know, our market grows by five to six times overnight, and that is good enough. But also it is true that every state in the country is required by law to build these health insurance marketplaces called exchanges, which were in a perfect place to license, and those are gigantic and large deals for us. So we've pivoted our business around the Affordable Care Act significantly and see it as an unalloy plus. So we have a sequester. The government is cutting down. These exchanges, is there a risk that I call on January 1 and try to call somebody at Uncle, you know, at the government and say, in what, 37 states? Is there a risk that no one's going to be there? So I think the enrollment process of this, at the end of this year, is going to be messy. It's going to be messy not because of the sequester, but because when you look at the history of any large program, it takes years to stabilize. I mean, Medicare Part D, the first two years of enrollment were just messy, and that's the... That's simply a function of tens of millions of customers trying to get enrolled all at the same time, you know, having long wait times on the customer service line or websites that go down and so on and so forth. 
that is inevitable and at some level going to happen. Our view is, you know, the messiness is par for the course. If we continue to innovate and we continue to bring to consumers um, the ability and the way to sort of consume and buy plants and use those plants where they are in a way that is uniquely suited to their needs, we're going to build a great business. So Hamid, how, you're a company that kind of really is a drop box for medical images. Are you impacted by uh, the Obamacare? Or? We are. Uh, maybe by way of background, I can give you some statistics. There are about 600 million medical imaging exams, particularly in radiology, done on an annual basis. Another 400 million non-radiological imaging exams. Total is about $120 billion a year market. Somewhere about 25 billion of that is repeat exams simply because the new physician doesn't have access to the history of the patient. Up until this point, up until Accountable Care Act and accountable care organizations and going from pay fee for service to value based, incentives were misaligned to a radiologist, to a cardiologist who happened to have an echocardiogram in their office. A repeat exam paid as much as a non repeat exam. There was no incentive in stopping that. Now, when you're at risk, the first thing you want to do is stop that. So all of a sudden, radiology has gone from being 30% of the bottom line of a hospital to let's not have that MRI used on that patient. So it's a tremendous difference. And David, from your, your perspective? Slightly different perspective. I think, I think for, um, for digital health or whatever, it's just a huge opportunity. It's like this crazy kind of reshuffling going on. And fundamentally, nobody is, while they're reshuffling, has, you know, is figuring out the basics of like, how to translate advances into actual better respiratory care. So you go work on that and deliver that in a great way. You build an awesome product. And the, all the reshuffling and staging is, uh, is like fertile ground for experimentation and also for like crazy kinds of realignment where you see um, pharmacists playing you know, a hugely underutilized resource in the community. So you, you can imagine new kinds of align, uh, you know, new kinds of arrangements that have the ability to kind of uh, take out some fundamental problems that have, um, you know, potentially obstructed del uh, delivery of good care and treatment in the past. So, as we look at your business model, I'm intrigued. What is your business model, and, and do you work through people or, or not, or how, how you know? I, so why don't you describe how you kind of thought about your business model? And then for the entrepreneurs, how do you think about collaboration or with a large organization or small? How did you go through that thought process? To me? Yeah. Um, our model is to essentially cut the amount of uh, money that people, that plans, payers, delivery systems spend on, on uncontrolled asthma or on COPD. So if you manage COPD and asthma effectively, you can knock out thousands of dollars in unnecessary healthcare costs. And what we do is use technology and then a whole raft, perhaps more than I imagined when I got into it, of, of human services and, and attention to get people um, to so, sort of support better self-management and to give um, clinical side into um, you know, in new inside how their panels of patients are doing. Um, so that, that is essentially our business model. But our mission is like, it's not to, um, you know, not to make it uh, not to add to the burden of it, but to figure out how to make it easier for people to better manage it with less effort, right? Like if I build something that actually is, is a, uh, you know, adds one more dollar of cost or adds 10 more minutes of time that somebody in a family or household has to deal with, um, I, we should just write the obituary and go home, you know? Literally, those days are over now. Like the launch of Shared Clarity just shows that fundamentally, you know? There, there will be no market for an ineffective device or a pharmaceutical anymore. It's over. And um, so uh, I think you know, what follows from that is, some, is a pretty clear model about who you sell to. You sell to people who have financial risk for, for crappy outcomes that we've tolerated in the past. And we won't stand for that anymore. We have to do a better job. And hopefully, we just knock the thing out altogether, and we can go home. You know. So, uh, Hamid, what, what's your buzz, business model? Uh, you know, who do you sell to, and how do you see building your business? So we have an endpoint that uh, we hope payers will want to subsidize or at least pay a portion of our services because they're the ones who get to benefit from reduction of unnecessary exams and the $25 billion of waste. But if you think of us as a network similar to a cell phone model, 
you have to have a bunch of handsets before you have a network. So to start with, we sell applications to providers that cause them to join the network. And those applications are basically to improve their referrals or service their community better. Uh, at the moment, we charge a service fee, depending on volume, for providers. And there are four or five different kinds of applications of our network. And depending on which ones they choose, their rates change, very much like a cell phone plan. You get a portion that is use it or lose it on a monthly basis. So we start on a minimum. Uh, we also, on the marketing side, specifically target the largest thousand healthcare systems in the country. Because that's where 70% of all imaging exams occur, or that's where the specialists live, where people need to bring imaging. So we're very exclusionary as to who we sell our services to. So is, is this a good model? Because I look at large insurance companies, and Aetna's innovative, as we heard, and really unique. But I'm not sure they're writing checks. Or I don't know if they're a customer or not. And then I look at the hospitals, and there's a CIO, there's a bureaucracy, and they have money, but it takes a long time for a sales cycle. So what is that? How has that impacted you as you kind of think about raising money and funding and, and kind of how did that approach you as you're kind of looking at your business model and figuring out, you know, I, we were involved with uh, Athena Health, and we used to say SaaS models are great, but the trouble is you're financing your customers. It sounds like you're almost doing that a little yourself, I mean, if you're waiting for the insurance company. So how have you thought about that? We're doing a lot more than a little of that, yes. It's a very expensive company to get off the ground, uh, but it's a recurring kind of revenue. Uh, we do have minimums that we expect our customers to have a range. For instance, in a large health system, we expect to be somewhere between two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year uh, in terms of expenditure. Uh, we built this business model based on getting to profitability in two thousand fifteen and needing a lot of dollars between now and then. So yes, we we too finance our customers and. Thanks to venture capital, we get access to enough money. So, so Chinny, your, your company's, you know, soon to be break even cash flow. You've gone through a little money. How do you, how do you, how do you think about that? And as the entrepreneurs are thinking about, you know, starting a business, you know, uh, what what are the lessons learned, and how do you think about kind of if you were doing it again, or or the challenges on on thinking about financing a, an early stage healthcare IT company. So, um, I think doing any company, uh, certainly in healthcare IT, you know, perhaps not with respect to pharmaceutical development, you know, has a nice analogy to poker in that you want to be counting cards. You want to be throwing a lot more money against, you know, a hand that looks good and, and you know, attenuate the amount of capital you raise when things are a lot more experimental. And, um, the, the two or three things that have held us in good stead is, you know, we have not been afraid to say when we're wrong and cut our losses. Um, we have not been afraid to experiment, but we've... Okay, wait a go, go back to that. So yeah. you have some guy that gives you his hard-earned venture funds. He invests. He comes to the board meeting six, you know, the three months, and you say it's not working, and, you know, you throw the business plan over your shoulder. How, how do they react? I mean, you know, it's kind of they... They spent six months getting to know you, feel comfortable. This is our vision. We're all in. How, how does that work? And <laughs> so Tom should know the answer to this because we had that exact same experience with Tom. Uh, uh, I think I would summarize the answer as um, in a couple of parts. So first of all, I think any as with, as you build a business, first of all you do want to be looking for seasoned investors because if there's one truth in building a company, you know, the plan you set out with is certainly very unlikely to be the plan that you'll succeed with. So you're going to, you know, be twisting and turning and meandering your way to success. And it's important that uh, to do two or three things. So first, I mean, you want to be, you know, absolutely maintain integrity, but you do want to build relationships with your board and your investors and you want to tell them, What's go exactly what's going right and what's going wrong, so that you know these decisions are shared. Um, you know when things work, that's it's great. You know when things uh, you know don't work, 
you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of pain, but you know, if you pivot around it and understand what the lessons from it and, and you know, change with it, um, you know, oftentimes you come to a much better place. And certainly, you know, from our own experience, you know, we learned back in 2009 that merely providing our leads to other brokers did not work. We retrenched, we, you know, we built a model where we directly serviced the business, but in hindsight, there was a lot of pain we paid in 2009 that put us in a super later position to take advantage of the opportunities that the Affordable Care Act offered. So, you know. So being a little lucky in the right place counts? So it counts I, for a lot. So I, I guess, you know, David, as I kind of think about your business and how do you think about competition? And, you know, I heard that Aetna has a lot of apps and they have all the data. You know, how, how are you kind of thinking about competition and early stage company and how do you go and pitch what is unique about what you have versus the the other apps or you know as you look at asthma and people have said they've failed in disease management so how did you position yourself as many of these people would like to know is okay how do I think about raising money and how do I differentiate myself and what is my unfair advantage and I think in healthcare IT everybody talks about technology enabled services but it's, it's confusing, and there's a lot of people that are kind of saying it's, it's hard to understand what, what differentiates you from four other guys. So how did you go about that when you were looking at your raising your money and building your plan? I go through phases where I, I pay more attention to competition and less attention to competition. I'm currently in one where I'm not paying that much attention to it. <laughs> um, largely because... You have your money. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, no, it's because... Um, We've, we've been involved in discussions with potential um, competitors, and I mean large-scale competitors, where it became so obvious that they were so dysfunctional and huge that they were never going to accomplish what we would be able to do. And um, if we just, if we were able to actually ignore them, and it's hard to do, right, because they're a potential short circuit to a big market or a, a big um, group of, of customers or a big revenue line. But the trick is, I think, is to not pay attention to them and actually just focus on what you are able, what you, what you really have, which is your ability to solve the problem in a way that no one has been able to do so far. And um, it's, I mean, in the case of asthma, it's not the, it's not like we're inventing something new. It's a, it's a people problem essentially. And what what we've been able to um, to rally around as a company and with investors is to think about ways in which. We, um, we learn from all of the evidence-based literature and wisdom that's been accumulated, and we use technology in this way to actually, um, as a tool, right, for the company to actually put it all together and to be able to target and evaluate it much faster than anybody would be able to do who's a potentially giant competitor. I am sure we will have competition, and candidly, it, I don't think it would be the worst thing. Uh, it, would, it would be okay to have more competition because it, it helps validate the market a little bit. Really interesting. Uh, when we started VisiQ, we were the only guys doing it, and it was really hard to tell people to change. And they said, "Well, who else can we go to?" So that's a that's an interesting point. So I have two last questions, and then we'll hopefully get people to ask their own questions of you guys. So dealing with large companies, if you look at the healthcare IT space, there's large insurance companies, large hospitals, and then there's these these guys, the EMRs of the world, the Cerners. You know, Epic, which is uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, obviously. Athena, which we believe is disruptive, but I think you look at these big companies. How do you think about them as partners? Because they're all out there saying, we want to work with you, and they all have initiatives. And I mean, and, and so maybe Hamid, as you kind of think about, you know, in your business, I'm sure there's a lot of big companies say we could be an add on or application. But in my uh, history, I've found most companies have gotten crushed by the big companies and not gotten what they wanted. So how do you think about in the current world or as you kind of built your plan, how have you thought about large EMR companies? Uh, I think it's true that lots of times the larger software vendors in this particular area in HIT manage to have new modules and the new modules replace whatever new smaller companies there may be. Uh, we happen to have a particular niche that no one essentially goes after. Imaging has always been this voodoo of uh, software development, when larger files. Pick. You say that, but I see 
Lee Phillips and Siemens. Lots of guys have They've big all... machines that they sell for $16 million. I'm sure over here at the hospital there's a lot of those. So They all have acquired imaging software companies. None of them have developed it from within. They do develop software for their own scanners because they have a lot of physicists, but they're by and large not software developers. They're device developers that happen to include software. So, so, so does that mean you're, if you're going to, you know, venture capitalists like to say we're long-term investors, but we also want to get our money back. So do you, is that what would be illogical as you think about kind of who you're partnering with or leveraging? How much does it take into account, well, this person might buy me and could be a potential sale. Do you, do you think about that? Because as entrepreneurs are here, they're all saying, okay, who's going to buy you? And every public multiple, you know, Athena is at 100 PE or something today, but it won't be there tomorrow probably. So if you think about kind of selling your company or getting liquidity, how, how do you think about that and how does that tie in your partnering? I think that somewhat is an extension of your previous question is how much money do you, lose, you raise and how do you get to break even and so forth. Uh, it, we're looking at our company as a very large market potential. Uh, when you think about having a drop box for imaging as you call it, there aren't going to be five different networks around the country that exchange all of this. There are going to be maybe one or two or three. And uh, If you lead the pack, chances are you're going to be a premier network. If you're in that shape, you're looking at a $3 billion market. Uh, as a result, you want to manage to be as independent as possible for as long as possible to get the highest exit and have your venture capital friends be patient with you as much as possible. In that regard, we look at the market for exit in three or four different buckets. The bucket is the large animals like GE and Siemens and Philips that roam around our market. The second is the very EMR vendors that you talked about because they get a disproportionate advantage if they have a very well integrated imaging component into their EMR. Third is perhaps other health information exchange vendors. As you saw, Aetna is very proud of the fact that they are now a software vendor selling or offering their services into the health systems. So they could also be a potential exit for us. Okay. So my last question to each of you is, if your VC fires you tomorrow and you have a 100-year or 10-year non-compete, you know, as everybody's out here thinking about where are the opportunities, where, what would you do and where would you focus your attention if you couldn't go in the imaging space where you described, I mean, what, what do you think are the opportunities today, you know, kind of real time that you'd say, I really, this could be a great opportunity to start a company? I primarily see two very large opportunities in healthcare IT. One is big data, and it's because we're going from fee-for-service where no one cared what outcomes are to knowing, needing to grab a whole bunch of data and deciding what outcomes drive, how you price yourself. Uh, you hear a lot about going from fee-for-service to value-based pricing. Nobody really knows how to price that stuff. Nobody knows how to measure the quality. Uh, the data is there. Uh, I think our previous speakers were talking about how much data matters. But we don't have the analytics today. And I'm sure whatever analytics platforms there are today, we will, will be the first generation and three generations later, in 10 years from now, you'll have brand new uh, kinds of things to look at. A uh, second is the very obvious mobile environment. Uh, healthcare, by and large, has been disconnected from mobility of any kind. Uh, whatever physicians carry in their pockets is their personal mobility. It's very little of it ties back into the enterprise. There's a lot of opportunity there for invention, for innovation, for capturing market. Chinny? But I wouldn't sign a 10-year non-compete. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I sort of had, I guess, two answers, and my first answer is very much parallel, Hamid. So I think at the end of the day, you know, there are large trends in computing, um, and they are, you know, going from enterprise software to SaaS, you know, big data, you know, the mobile revolution, and those revolutions, you know, bear fruit across all verticals, and there's no reason why they shouldn't bear fruit in healthcare IT, and there's numerous business problems you can sort of attack, whether it's you know, Dropbox for imaging and not Dropbox for something else. And so th I think those are very, very fertile areas for attack because... Um, it has some regulatory barriers, right? 
There are. HIPAA, there are. I mean, unlike a lot of other places, you can't share data. There's a, you know. I, I absolutely agree. So what I would say, though, is that to build those kinds of businesses and to overcome the kind of barriers and financing barriers inherent in SaaS models and large service-oriented models, you know, uh, these are capital-intensive critical businesses, you know, best created in places like Silicon Valley where you've got lots of access to capital. So that's sort of answer number one. And then there's answer number two, which is, um, you know, tons of, the best innovations out there often come from things that people don't think about. And, you know, if you figured out you know, some kind of very clinical problem where measuring something mobile sort of really makes this big outcomes difference uh, to somebody's health, then, you know, that doesn't fit, fit some box very neatly. That's, you know, comes out of left field and often those, those ideas and those, those businesses are the greatest. If this is gonna be your last question, then I'll be remiss if I didn't say we're recruiting. And we're recruiting for lots of marketing positions. So please see me if you're interested. Okay. Okay, David. Thanks. Yeah. I don't have the vision and experience that these guys do. Um, I take a much different approach, which is uh, I latch onto stuff, as you heard, that that made me that makes me crazy. Like my mom died on the day this company was born, and I literally lost the last three weeks of her life to hospital delirium. Right, and so I've been keeping you know it's on my list. It's at the top of my list. When this is done, I'm going after hospital delirium because nobody cares about it. But it took something from me, and I'm, and that, is like, I think you have to have that kind of, I at least have to have that kind of personal attachment to what I am battling, because, you know, every day it's like a different and totally unexpected and often totally unwelcome challenge, but I'm in there because I just can't not do it, right? And I, and the other thing I'm after, so I've got my list, hospital delirium is number one. Um, and there's a long list, and I would love to, to, uh, to delegate if anyone wants. <laughs> uh, but the other thing I'm really frustrated about is the sublimation of everything about health to the individual. I don't think that individual behavior is responsible for all the, the poor health in this country. And I am so ready to see somebody. And actually, the surprising thing is I think the plans and the big provider groups are, are starting to do that and invest upstream. Like, let's go after some of the big socioeconomic determinants and stop blaming everybody for, you know, uh, for the poor health that, that befalls them. So I am, uh, that's what I'd go after. So, so as an entrepreneur, just to kind of follow up on that, as an entrepreneur looking at kind of impacting the health condition, has this been easier or harder than you anticipated if you went back to your days in Arizona or the White House or, you know, in trying to, to get this vision and, and, and the tenacity that it takes to succeed? Again, like total lack of experience. I, I, the biggest, one of the biggest hesitations I had about leaving the academic environment was I thought that business was going to be easy, easier, <laughs> right? I'm sorry. I'm just t being totally candid. And, um, Don't tell Stefano that. Can I? I uh, um, I mean, it just shows you how what I what I didn't know, right? It is it is so it is so intellectually challenging for me, and it takes so much longer, and it has uh, it has so many weird like um, liminal phases where you take one set of problems and you solve for them, only to find that somebody's dropped off a new set of problems. And I kind of love it, but man, is it hard, and does it take a long time and a lot more money? So. Okay, so now we have about 15 minutes for questions or we all go have beers. I mean, so we're open. Uh, there's two mics if people have questions. Well, I guess that's our answer. Huh? So anyway, I want to thank everybody for coming and staying this, uh, to this last session. And I think I really want to thank, oh, here we have a question. Oh, and I'm not sure. Yeah, ask you a question. Um, Abraham uh, was talking about uh, low-hanging fruit when, you know, had the apple underneath his table and there's the maximum, of course, that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, now, I'm from Scotland and our, our food habits are not very good. Um, but I've been in the U.S. a while and I've noticed that they're not so good here as well. Maybe California is better. Um, how do we get to the heart of the matter, which is stopping from people from getting into hospitals and, you know, really, you know, helping them make 
better decisions, but not blaming the individuals, absolutely, but getting the uh, uh, companies that make the food, um, make it less toxic and, and less sugar. And one, one last thing I just noticed is, is that any healthcare event I go to, they have the most uh, Dr. Peppers and uh, Coca-Cola and Fudge Brownies and things like that. So, so I, I, is there something we can do there on that front to really help people make healthier choices and, and will, will the health insurance com companies as well jump in and help there too? I, what, I'm, what I'm enthusiastic about is what we've seen on, from the plan and big provider integrated system side where they have so many, uh, such a significant fraction of a, of a metro's population under membership now that they can, it actually, you know, under capitated environment or, or outcome based reimbursement, it actually starts to make sense to invest upstream because then downstream benefits befall you. And, uh, I think there's going to be some, some very clever kind of work done there. Um, you're already seeing it in sort of social impact investment um, here in Fresno around asthma and in-home interventions, some really clever financing of strategies that, at least in the literature, make sense. And, and um, I wouldn't be surprised to see that take off. So one area that's we're seeing innovation is uh, there was a company called Iora Health, which is based on, you know, some kind of thinking about casino workers in Atlantic City, and they've now gone to Las Vegas, and I was there last week. And what you're seeing is unions are saying, we want to take care of our members. And so what we're going to do is have health coaches. And so they're not physicians. And I think Annie Lamont, who is a very successful venture capitalist who was earlier, kind of articulated that, you know, we have to look at a little different models. And I think what you're going to see with healthcare IT is if you have some of these tools and data, you know, whether it's big data or even little data, I mean, I, I argue... We talk about big data, but I was with the, I shouldn't mention the hospital, but I was with the CIO and the CMO, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Information Officer. And the Chief Medical Officer said, I really like to have big data, and, you know, and the CIO says, I can't do anything. I'm bogged down. I have no, no time to do what I have to do with my system. And so I asked the CMO, I said, well, what is big data? He said, well, I've bought a whole bunch of physician practices and I want to see if they're referring to our hospital. So there's a whole definition of kind of what is big data or little data. You know, and it, you know, it seemed intuitively obvious. You want analysts, you could figure that out. But, and so I think, but Iora is kind of saying we have two doctors, we have 16 people, and we're going to manage. And so that what they're saying is you're not going to have a doctor. You're going to come into our clinic, and we're going to manage the diabetic, and we're going to have a, a Wednesday night session. And we're going to be there and be your coaches, and we're going to weigh you. And they, it's really an interesting model. And so they've now gone to Dartmouth. They probably have 10 hospitals. And so I think what you might see is, as people are shifting and understanding the cost, like a union, I think you'll see some models that are, as David described, kind of taking a, a, a real impact. And if you're in Las Vegas, I forget what they have, 60 thousand union members or something in a, a community of a million or two or whatever it is. And so you take that 60,000 and you're saying, we're not going to give you a doctor. We're going to have a doctor in our center kind of work with you and you're going to come every week. It's going to have a big impact, you know, and they're open Saturdays and they're open until 10 o'clock at night so they can get the people off shift. So I think it's, uh, so I think you're going to see some interesting things. Anyway, well, listen, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us and I want to thank our panel. <laughs>